All right, this one's going to be a little bit shorter, I think. <clears throat> um, okay, last Tuesday when I saw y'all, we talked about the extreme value theorem, talked about critical numbers. Uh, basically, extreme value theorem just says that if your function's continuous from A to B, then you have to have an absolute max or a min. Um, but I don't think we got to any problems where we actually used it. So these are a couple of problems um, where you will use the extreme value theorem. And the way you do it is I give you a function, and then I'll say find the absolute max and the absolute min somewhere on that interval. Um, I don't think I'm going to do number two. Let me scratch that out. Ooh, that was a big pin. I wasn't expecting that. How exciting. All right. Um, okay, so if you are to find the absolute max and min, uh, the thing you have to remember is absolute extrema can occur on the endpoints. So x equals 0 or 3 could be the max or the min. But local extrema can also be the absolute. So what I'm going to have to do, since local extrema occur at critical numbers, first thing I'm going to have to do is find the critical numbers of this function. And if you remember, critical numbers are when you set the derivative equal to 0 and solve. So I'll find my derivative. This is just a power rule. 3x squared minus 12. Set that equal to 0 and we'll solve. Um, I like to solve by factoring, so I'm going to take out the 3. That will give me x squared minus 4 equals 0. Then I'll get 3x plus 2, x minus 2 is equal to 0. And you have critical numbers of negative 2 and positive 2. Now, those are candidates for your absolute max or min. One thing you have to remember when you're doing extreme value theorem is that sometimes your critical numbers aren't on the interval. So I'm only looking from x is 0 to x is 3. So even though negative 2 is a critical number, even though that's a critical number, I'm not going to worry about that one because it's not on the interval 0 to 3. So we throw negative 2 out, and we're only going to consider 2. Uh, now, there is a long way that you could determine whether 2 is a max or a min, but if you're on a closed interval, what I'm trying to figure out is which is the highest point and which is the lowest point, and it's either going to be on the endpoints or at the critical number. So rather than go through this long, convoluted process to determine whether or not 2 is a max or a min, I'm simply going to plug all of the candidates into my function. I'll find f of 0, I'll find f of 3, because those are my two endpoints. My max could be at those two, or my max could be at 2, or my minimum. So I'm just going to plug those into the function. f of 0, 0 cubed minus 12 times 0, I think is 0. f of 3, 3 cubed is 27, minus 12 times 3 is 36. 27 minus 36 is negative 9. Uh, then if I plug in 2, 2 cubed is 8. Minus 12 times 2 is 24. That gives me negative 16. And when you plug them all in, I want to know which of these values for y. I have 0 negative 9, and negative 16. i got to find which one's the highest value and which one's the lowest. And when I find those, uh, then that tells me what my max or my min is. So my max occurs at x equals 0. My min occurs at x equals 2. And 9, or 3, is just nothing. So I, I would say there's an absolute max. And the max value, I have a max of 0, and it occurs at x equals 0. And then I have an absolute minimum value of negative 16. So negative 16 is the minimum value, and it occurs at x equals 2. So that's how we're going to find absolute max and mins if you're on a closed interval. If you're on a closed interval, it makes it a lot easier. Um, let's see, another one. Let's see, two, three or four. Which one should we do? Which one should we do? Which one should we do? Let's do, mm, let's do three. Let's do three. Let's do three. Hey, go away. Box, go away. Hey, hey, wait. Why isn't the box going away? There, okay. Um, so I'm trying to find my critical numbers to, in order to get my absolute max or min, so I'm going to find my derivative. F prime is derivative of x squared is 2x. Ooh, derivative of 2 over x. How do you do that? How many of y'all just said quotient rule? I would not. Change, change 2 over x. Change 2 over x to 2x to the negative 1. If I do that, if I think of 2 over x as 2x to the negative 1, then I can just do my power rule. Bring down the negative, so that would be negative 2, x to the negative 2 power. Good, good. Good, 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 good. All right. Oh, this is, oh, interesting. No, okay, never mind. Whew, sorry. A few thoughts. Um, I saw it since I just kind of stopped in mid-sentence. 
um, I'm always thinking while I'm working these problems, the extreme value theorem, it says if f is continuous, in order to use extreme value, your extreme value theorem, your function must be continuous from A to B. And while I was looking at this, the reason I kind of hesitated is because I noticed that zero is a discontinuity. This has a vertical asymptote at x equals zero. So I started to say that I can't use the extreme value theorem, but zero is not on the interval. So we're still safe to use extreme value theorem because from one half to two, this function is continuous. Uh, so I'm going to keep going with this problem. Again, I like to solve by factoring. So now that I have my derivative, I'm going to factor. And if you remember yesterday, when you factor, I can obviously pull out a two. But if I, when I pull out my x, you pull out the one with the smaller exponent. So I'm going to take out x to the negative 2, and that'll leave me with x cubed, because when you multiply that through, x to the negative 2 times x cubed, you add those and you get x to the first. And then I pulled out negative 2, x to the negative 2, or that would actually be minus 1, wouldn't it? Well, well. So I factor out the 2x to the negative 2, leaves me with x cubed minus 1 equals 0. Um, Critical numbers, now I know that at x equals 0, because that's the same thing as 2 over x squared, and x cannot be 0, but that's not on the interval anyway, so I'm, I thought about it, I noticed it, but I don't have to worry about it anymore because I'm only looking from 1 half to 2. x cubed minus 1 equals 0, and that occurs when x is equal to 1, so that's another critical number. So to find out where my absolute max or min is, I have a critical number at 1, then I have... Uh, end points at 1 half and 2, so I will find f of 1 half, which will be 1 half squared is 1 fourth, plus 2 divided by 1 half is 4, and that ends up being um, 4 and 1 fourth, or 17 over 4, however you want to say that, or 4.25, whatever. Uh, then I'll plug in my right end point, f of 2, 2 squared is 4, plus 2 divided by 2 is 1, that's 5, so right now, that's higher than 17 over 4. So that right now is my absolute max. But I still have to see what's happening at 1. So f of 1 is going to be 1 cubed, or 1 squared, which is 1. 2 divided by 1, which is 2. 1 plus 2 is 3. And my absolute max and absolute min, max is, my absolute max is at x equals 2. And I'm just going to write it as an ordered pair. Absolute max is at the ordered pair 2, 5. My minimum is at the ordered pair 1, 3. So that's how we're going to find absolute maxima and absolute minima on the extreme value theorem. Um, so what I would like you all to do, I've done two of these. I want you all to do these other two problems for homework, numbers three or numbers 2 and number 4. Um, so if you all could do those in addition to page 276, which hopefully you've already done that. But... Um, <clears throat> actually, I think 276 had some problems like this. Numbers 35, 38, and 41 of your homework are similar to these problems right here. So uh, add these to it. And then the next thing I want to look at is in the next section. It's called the mean value theorem. It's another one of your big theorems in calculus. Uh, see if I can get this dotted box to go away. Ah, got it. Um, okay, the mean value theorem. The mean value theorem. And mean, in this case, is referring to average. Average, so it's not mean as in hateful value theorem. Some of you may think that. I don't know. All right. If your function is differentiable uh, between A and B on the interval A to B, then there must exist some C on A to B such that, and fill in the blank, this is the conclusion of your mean value theorem. F prime of C is equal to F of B minus F of A over B minus A. That is your mean value theorem as your mean value theorem. Um, sometimes you'll see it referred to as the mean value theorem for derivatives. And the reason is um, next semester, we're actually going to learn another mean value theorem. It's called the mean value theorem for integrals. But you don't have to worry about what that means yet. But this is the mean value theorem for derivatives, um, or just the mean value theorem. We can call it, if you want to, you can call it the MVT, mean value theorem. Uh, and what this is saying, F prime of C, that just means the slope at C. Uh, that's something we've been doing for a while. F prime of C means the slope at C. Hopefully you knew that. Does that other fraction look familiar? F of B minus F of A over B minus A. What is that? What is that? What is that? Nobody? Nobody? Really? Okay. F of B minus F of A over B minus A. That is simply your algebra 1 slope. Change in Y over change in X. That is the slope from 
x equals b to x equals a. Uh, so graphically, what that means, I gave you an x-y axis down here. So uh, let's see, this is y axis, that's your x axis. What this means graphically, and this may make a little bit more sense once I do this, you have a function that is continuous from A, and your function is continuous, uh, not only continuous, but differentiable, which means it's smooth. There are no cusps or anything funny like that. So I have a differentiable function, and let's say it just looks like this. And I'm differentiable from A to B. This is saying that somewhere between A and B, the tangent slope is equal to the slope from A to B. So if I found the slope from A to B, which that's the slope of the line from A to B, I have to, at some point on this curve, at some point on this curve, there has to be a tangent with the exact same slope, and it occurs right here. So the mean value theorem just says that somewhere between A and B, there has to be a point on the curve where the tangent is parallel to the slope of the secant. That's your mean value theorem. That's your mean value theorem. Um, <clears throat> and where this is used is actually kind of a cool story. Um, where this is used is, uh, uh, yeah, people don't actually think of calculus when they do this, but this is actually an, an application for it. Uh, do any of y'all know what a turnpike is? Do any of you know what a turnpike is? Anybody? Anybody? All right. Well, a turnpike is a road. We're going to say that's a road. And the way a turnpike works is before you get on the turnpike, you go through a little booth. Here's a little booth. And here's a man sitting on the booth because it's too hot, cold inside the booth. I don't know. He's sitting up there. All right, so there's a man sitting on the booth. And you're coming along here in your car. So your car is right here. There's your car. And you're driving in your car and you're bebopping along. Ah, oh, geez, the wheels fell off. Why does that happen? Ah, let's see. Uh, wait a minute. Hold on. No. Stupid car. Here we go. Right, so you're bebopping along in your car and you get to the turnpike. And what you do is you give the man a little bit of money for the privilege of using this fine road called the turnpike. Let's say you got on the turnpike at 1 o'clock. And then you're bebopping along and you travel along. And what happens is eventually you get to the end of the turnpike. Here's the end of the turnpike and there's another man sitting on the roof over here. Oh, what happened to him? Oh, gosh, his legs are falling off. There we go. Um, so you driving along, you're driving along, you're driving along, and then uh, what you do is you pay money, or you don't pay money, but you give him your ticket when you get off the turnpike. Now, let's say that the two booths are 150 miles apart. So the turnpike is 150 miles, and let's say somewhere on the turnpike, maybe right when you get on there, there's a sign that says, hey, if you're going to ride on this road, you have to dra dra travel You have to travel 70 miles an hour or less. So let's say that you came on the turnpike, doop, 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 you got your ticket at 1 o'clock, and you're driving along, driving along, driving along, having a good time. The kids start to misbehave, so you pull over for a second so you can spank them. You get back on the road. Oh, goodness. You get back on the road. Like, hey, get back on the road. There we go. Get back on the road, and you're driving along. And you get over here. And you say, all right, sir, I'm through with the turnpike. And you give him your ticket, and he says, all right, it is 3 o'clock. And then the guy looks at him and says, wait a minute. It's 3 o'clock. Ah! And what will he do? Well, if it took you two hours to go 75 miles, then he's going to say, hmm, you averaged 75 miles per hour. That was the average velocity over that road. And what they can do legally is actually give you a ticket because your average velocity was higher than 70. So if your average velocity was 75 miles an hour, then using the mean value theorem, average velocity means the slope from A to B. Your average velocity was 75. So somewhere along that road, you had to be going 75 miles an hour. And they will actually give you a ticket. Now, maybe not all turnpikes work this way, but there is one somewhere. I just forgot where it is. So that's an application of the mean value theorem. Um, of course, I doubt the person who's standing up here on the roof losing his legs is aware that he's using calculus. But he is. But he is. Um, so there's the mean value theorem. It is one of the big theorems in calculus. And uh, we're going to use it on number five. And then I want you to do number six for homework. And what this says is find the value of C that satisfies the mean value theorem. So here, here we go. Um, let's see, let's see. If this is my function, the mean value theorem says f prime of c is equal to f of b minus f of a over b minus a. And in this case, a and b are three and neg or negative 3 and 1. So f prime of c is going to be f of 1 
minus f of negative 3 over 1 minus negative 3, and we'll work that out. f of 1, 1 squared plus 4 times 1 is 5, minus negative 3 squared is min, min, 9, minus 12 is negative 3, over 1 plus 3 is 4, so that ends up being 2. 8 over 4 is 2. So that's the average slope. The slope from negative 3 to 1 is 2. So what this is saying is that somewhere you should have a tangent with a slope of 2. And to find out where that occurs, I need f prime of c, so I have to find f prime of x. By the way, I'm not doing number 6. f prime of x is just power rule, 2x plus 4. And if that's f prime of x, then f prime of c is 2c plus 4. And to find out where the slope is equal to 2, then we'll just set f prime of c, 2c plus 4, equal to 2. Solve the equation, 2c is negative 2, c is negative 1. So that is the point, and it is between a and b, that is the point where the slope of the tangent is equal to the slope of that secant. So that is the mean value theorem. It's finding that place where the slope of the tangent equals the slope of the secant from a to b. And that's it. Um, add number 6 to your homework. So you have number 6. You also have numbers 2 and 4 on the other side of the sheet. And page 276. Do not do the page 288 that's on the board for Thursday night. Y'all don't have to do that. We'll worry about that later. Um, and don't forget, test is next Thursday. So that's it. I will see you all later.